Hello, everyone. Can you hear me pretty good? Yes. Yeah, Wait, hello. Okay. Right. Yes, you sound okay. great. All right, I didn't know for sure. Sometimes I get on the uh, wrong speaker and I have to change in my settings in my, um, in my system. Well, I want to say good evening to everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Night Live. And um, Pastor Sneed is, is a little bit under the weather and he asked me to step in for him. So you don't have to adjust your screen or anything. I'm not Pastor Sneed. You know, he's taller than I am. So, uh, but a lot, I've met a lot of you. A lot of faces, familiar faces that I'm seeing now. And so what, uh, what I'm going to ask is that um, we're going to look at Romans chapter one tonight. We may or may not get through the whole chapter. We'll get through as much as we possibly can in our allotted time. But I am going to leave uh, some time for questions at the uh, uh, very almost at the end of our session. So about maybe 15, 10 minutes for, for questions. So uh, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for being God. We thank you that you are holy and righteous. We thank you, Lord God, that you looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. And so, Father, we give you thanks for the many things that you have done for us today, just today. And Lord, over our lifetime, you have always been good because you are great. And I ask, Lord, that the words of our mouths and, our, and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Show us yourself and help us to understand what it is you will have us know. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Okie doke. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of uh, scripture. We're going to do some background. We may even play, play a little Bible trivia just to see, you know, you know I just want to see what you know and everything. So we're going to look at Romans chapter one, if you have your Bible. I'm going to be teaching it out of the New King James Version of the Bible. And I have my iPad and I have my screen split and all that kind of stuff. And I'm looking at notes and everything. So uh, if, if you, I'm going to probably break this down into sections and give you some time with each section. If you have questions or you want to have comments, that, that will work as well. So um, Romans chapter one starts off with this character called Paul. And I'm pretty sure you know Paul. He's pretty prolific in the Bible. And just, just uh, asking a question at random, how many books of the New Testament did Paul write? Just a number. If anyone knows, just unmute yourself and say it. Was it 13? 12? Yeah, thir 13. 13 books. They believe he wrote Hebrews, but they're not sure that he wrote Hebrews. But he wrote over half, almost half the New Testament. And that mm -hmm. means that he is very prolific. What he says has a lot of, uh, is a very substantial amount of what our doctrine is today. So uh, as Paul has, has put it out there, as Christ has given it to him, he gives it to us today. And it's still truth. It's still the word of God passed down from generation to generation, uh, century to century, time to time. It's still the word of God. And so Paul is a, is a very interesting character. A little bit about Paul is that he... He didn't start out being a good guy, a nice guy. You know, he was, he's rough. Paul was rough. Uh, around all edges, he was rough. Uh, he was not a Christian to start out with. And he is, um, he is the um, epitome of what God can do with a person that's sold out to him. And so uh, let's start with verse one. It says, Paul a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Verse one, Paul, a bond servant, he calls himself a slave to Christ. Uh, remember, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit about his story. Paul was um, sat at the feet of the, the greatest teacher in, in, in Israel at the time, Gamaliel, and Paul was the star student of that class. Uh, he, he could argue with the best of them. 
about biblical uh, doctrine or Old Testament doctrine. But Paul's view about God was skewed and, and God had to do some, some correcting in his vision. And so uh, Paul had taken uh, upon himself to make everybody who confessed Christ as Lord make them feel um, a little bit uncomfortable about that confession. And Paul was uh, present at the, at the stoning of Stephen early in the church. And so Paul has a, a, a very um, a solid relationship with everything that's going on at this particular time, both from a, a Christian perspective and a non-Christian perspective. Paul before Christ and Paul after Christ. And we're going to see how he, he kind of weaves this in in this chapter. So he calls himself a bondservant, calls himself an apostle. Apostle means one that has been sent, one sent out. And remember Paul's story was that he was on the road to Damascus. And while he was persecuting the church, uh, God shows up, Jesus shows up on that road. And he says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And um, Paul's blinded, he, scales are on his eyes, Christ changes his uh, life immediately, and he begins to learn about who Jesus really is from uh, all the, all the uh, other apostles that, that God had called, Peter, James, John, all the disciples. They are all contemporaries. They all live the, 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 the same period of time together. So... They're teaching now this person that had a lot of authority to put them into death. Now they're teaching him about Christ. And, and that relationship is growing and it's developing. So uh, when, he cut, when he says that he's an apostle, apostle means that he is a special selected person by Christ to carry the gospel. And uh, he is separated uh, uh, from not the the people that were already in Christ, he was separated from those people, the higher ups. Paul was a uh, Benjamite by birth. He was a uh, Pharisee. And the Pharisees were just people that were super religious, followed the law to the very detail. And he even brags about it. He said, I was a, I was a, a Pharisee among Pharisees. You know, they could hold a candle to me. I had it all all down. I, I had the, the script. I wrote it. It was, it was there. So Paul then succumbs to uh, Christ's lordship and his whole attitude changes. His whole attitude changes. It's like uh, you would never know that that was Paul, Paul the, the, the persecutor. Now you have Paul, the champion of Christ. And he says so, uh, starting in verse one, he says that he was separated to preach the gospel of God the promise, uh, verse two, which he promised before through the prophets of the Holy Scriptures. He's showing you that he has church knowledge. He has scriptural knowledge about how God used the Old Testament prophets to forecast his plan of salvation through the generations and eventually being recognized through Christ. Um, he also, um, Paul, Paul, I mentioned that he's a Benjamite. He's from Tarsus. Uh, Tarsus is like a, a, a country in the present day Turkey in that region area around, you know, the, the uh, I'm trying to get my, my map together, somewhere in the upper part of the quadrant where Russia and, and all the Arabian countries right up above those, somewhere in that, in that vicinity. So Paul was a learned man. He was not a dumb person and he understood the law he understood afterward grace and truth as christ had made it evident to him and paul um in verse three says concerning the son concerning his son jesus christ our lord who was born from the seed of david according to the flesh and he declared to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead stop and take a breath paul mentions something here he mentions the Trinity in these, in these verses here, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says that uh, Jesus was talked about through the prophets. It was foretold. Talks about Jesus' humanity through the line of David, 
But then he mentions he was also born of God, born of the Father, which talks of God and raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I don't care what anybody tells you, the Trinity, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been in the creative act of our lives, of creation. He, he, uh, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit has always been there. And some people um, have, a, have some issues with that. And I, I won't go into detail, but know that Paul understood the foundation, one of the founding fathers of the church understood that God uh, presents himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, another thing about the book of Romans is divided into four categories. And the four categories are the wrath of God, the grace of God, the plan of God, and the will of God. And this first chapter, the first three chapters, pretty much focuses upon the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? It's the, the, the payment for disobedience, for denying the power of God. It's the, it's the uh, retribution you get for not having a relationship with God, to be forever separated from God. That's what Paul is addressing in, in chapters one, two, and three. And then later on, he talks about the grace of God and then the will, the plan of God and then the will of God. So the theme of the, of the whole book of Romans is about being made righteous, being made righteous to God by faith, by placing your trust in him. The principle of, of faith and the law. And he uses a lot of the law to uh, contrast what uh, grace is. The law of Moses was uh, written that it would point out our sins, but it could do nothing for our sins or forgive us of our sins. So grace, was extended to us through Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God. So I'm, I'm going pretty fast to these because it's all it's pretty much introduction of the letter that he's writing to the church. Um, let's see, verse starting at verse seven. So all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Um, who is he talking about? Is he talking about anyone or is he talking about everyone? In particular, he's talking about this church that grew up from almost nowhere because Paul did not start this church. He started many churches, but the Church of Rome, he did not, he did not birth. Um, many people believe that it was probably on the day of Pentecost when the, the Holy Spirit came. There were, there were many people gathered together from different nations, and as they scattered about, they started uh connecting together and they started the church in rome that's the possibility that's not for certain no one knows for sure but this church paul had never visited he never started it but he always wanted to be in rome he wanted to to be in rome for a specific reason and that was to preach the gospel to them as well so that's pretty much the the intro to the to the book um, I want to stop here. Maybe you have some questions, maybe you have some co comments. Go ahead and unmute yourselves and you can uh, make a comment, question, and then we'll, we'll continue on. Okay. All right. So here's, here's the meat of the matter here, starting with verse nine. I mean, eight. I'm sorry, starting with verse eight. Paul says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Remember, I said these people had never met Paul, but Paul has a burning desire to be with them. And first, he thanks God for them because he didn't have any, any attachment to them, although he had built a relationship with them. This letter was written to them just like the other letters were written to the other churches like Ephesians and, and Galatians and First, and First and Second Thessalonians, the Corinthian letters. These were all to, used to encourage the church as it was forming. 
Uh, Jesus has probably been gone maybe about 40 years as, as this letter has been, been written. And the church fathers are, are struggling trying to, to um, grow people in their faith. Um, Peter and, and James and John, they, they're, they're uh, taking this new, this new uh, religion now. It's, it's basically a new lifestyle for them because they're no longer considered Jews. They're considered Christian or believers or followers of the way. They are now part of something totally different that has never existed on the earth. And they're trying to figure out how do we relate to people in a way that, that upholds the, the great commission to go therefore and teach all nations and baptizing them in the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? And this is, this is some of that that's, that's happening as, as Paul was writing this letter. So Paul is thanking God for them, even though he hasn't met them. How many, how many of us pray for people that we don't even know? How many times do we say thank you, God, for the for the people that are in our lives that, you know, they're the sandpaper in our lives. I mean, they they like, you really don't want to pray for them, but you got to pray for them sometimes out of duty because they they, they can be that irritating to you, but God uses them to, to help you mature and grow, you know, and, and here's Paul, Paul's saying the same thing. I'm praying for you even though I don't know you. And your prayers are, 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 are being heard because people are, are, are talking about you all around the world. They're talking about your faith. They're talking about how you're growing, They're talking about how you are uh, being steadfast and immovable. Because this is Rome. Rome is the center of society at that particular time. Rome is the is the place where Caesar lives, the president, the White House. It's, it's, it, I mean, Rome is not like one of those cities like in a May, Mayberry RFD. Rome is one of those cities that's cosmopolitan. It, it has a lot of trappings in it and everything. And that's why Paul is, is saying that I'm praying for you. And, and evidently the prayers are working because these people are, are, um, are flourishing without pretty much a leader. So in verse nine, it says, um, hold on, my screen just went. Uh, verse nine says this, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Uh, that's still that desire. Verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established, firmed. <clears throat> that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. There is a scripture that says, as uh, uh, one man sharpens another as iron sharpens iron. I may have said it backwards, but as iron sharpens iron, man, so does one man sharpen another. And Paul is saying that here's the reason why I want to, to visit you. I want to establish you in your faith. I want to ground you. I want to build a relationship with you in Christ. And also, I want to be encouraged by you. So it's a mutual relationship. It's, it's not one where he, he's giving he's giving everything and not receiving anything. He's giving and he's receiving from them as well. So in our, in our walk with Christ, guess what? Christ surrounds us with people that will sometimes encourage us or we will encourage them. It will help us to be accountable, help us to grow, help us to uh, understand. And sometimes just another pair of eyes helps our perspective. Sometimes we get so um, myopic in our view that we can't see any other way. And God taps us on the shoulder and says, hey, that brother over there, go talk to him. He, 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 he can benefit from you and you can benefit from him. And hey, that sister over there, go tap her on the shoulder. Give her a call. Um, you can benefit from her and she can benefit from you. I want to share this story with you. Um, I got a high school friend that calls just 
last night, I mean, he, not last night, uh, he texted me about a night ago. And he said, hey, man, uh, what are you doing? I was like, nothing. I'm just, you know, doing doing life. He said, hey, I got an extra ticket to the Mavericks game. Why don't you come and go to the Mavericks game with me? I'm like, whoa. Yeah, I was like, well, how much does it cost? He says, no, it's free. And, and he's, a, he's a brother in Christ. And I was like, you know, that, that kind of stunned me because I was like, not really planning on doing anything like that, but God fixed it where we could get together. He lives in Houston and I live in, in, in Mansfield and we'll be meeting at the Mavericks arena just to you know, fellowship. So this is the kind of relationship that builds over time when we're talking about um, uh, sowing into other people's lives. Paul is sowing into their lives and they are sowing into his life. And we never know what the result's gonna be. We just go there by faith. And we say, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm supporting you. I believe you, I love you in the name of Jesus. These are all, all things that, that, that nurture a relationship. And so, um this desire that Paul has is not, I don't believe it's a, a um one that he just manifested himself. I think it was birthed in him through the spirit to get to these people that needed uh leadership, needed leadership in the church desperately. Um just think about it, you know, when you when you first started a job, you didn't know exactly what to do, but somebody came along, paired up with you to show you what the ins and outs of, of the job entail. And so the same thing Paul is, is, is doing with this congregation. He's pouring into them so that they can be mature, but he's also growing himself in a relationship with them. So I'm gonna stop right there. Do you have any comments, any questions? Um, go ahead and do so. You just unmute yourself. Okay. Well, actually, I have a question. Okay. So, did had Paul ever been there before, or had he just heard about them and? had a desire to go and fellowship with them and bring them the word or had right. he visited with them before and was coming okay. back paul paul had never been there he only heard the news of them growing in christ and having a relationship with christ and actually when he wrote this letter he had still had not got gotten there he said every time i wanted to come to you it's, it's uh, let's see, it's up further in the scripture. I may be past it, but every time I wanted to come to you, something else came up and I couldn't get to you. But now Paul is, is going, I don't want to give it away, but, but Paul is going to see uh, Caesar, the pastor Sunday preached from Acts 28 about the shipwreck and Paul being uh, a prisoner. Paul gets to Rome but it's not for a missionary journey. It's because Paul is a prisoner. And then while he's in Rome, he declares the word of God to these people. And even into the highest of heights to, to, to the emperor himself. So he's never been to Rome. This is all new territory for him. Good question. Anybody else? Uh, Brother Sam, I think uh, also, uh, if you look at the background, uh, the Jews there at that particular time had been tossed about because of the leadership in Rome at the time. Uh, I think it was twice that they were kicked out of Rome and then, uh, with one emperor and then uh, the other emperor when uh, he died and came back in, I, I'm not for sure if it was Nero or whoever it was, uh, allowed them to come back in, but then they were uh, suffering persecution by the Gentile uh, Christians at that particular point in time, the Jews were, which now brings a question that we have to really watch uh, when we deal with folks because uh, they look down upon the Jews, the Gentile Christians at that time, which created infighting. And uh, we, we understand whenever there's fighting involved, then there's division and division takes away from uh, the general message. This was what Paul, I believe, was uh, uh, trying to make sure and keep their spirits up. And that's what 
we have to do as Christians one to another is to keep one another lifted up. Good, 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 good observation, Ron. And, and that's a little bit further down in the lesson, too. Uh, Paul even makes that distinction between the people uh, that he's talking to, but he, he does it in a way that doesn't exclude them. He includes them in, in the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's go, let's continue on. Uh, I think it's verse 12 is where we are. That is, I may be encouraged by you, uh, by, I'm sorry, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. That's, that's what I was talking about. Uh, Paul saying that he, he was trying to get to them, but he just things just kept coming up. Things kept popping up, uh, putting out fires in other churches and, and stuff like that. You know, you know, the letter I think uh, Pastor talked, uh, preached on, I'm sorry, taught on the, the Corinthian church and how messed up they were. And he wrote one letter to the first Corinthian letter to them um, to straighten out some of the issues of the church. And I'm pretty sure this coincided with some of his delays of trying to get to Rome. And then he wrote another letter and that letter was lost. And he wrote a, a, a second Corinthians to uh, get that, uh, that letter to the church of Corinth. So Paul is, is more acting like a, a traffic cop almost. He's trying to uh, direct the people in, in, in godly way, uh, in a godly way, a godly way of living as well as trying to uh, establish other churches as well. So uh, Paul was a busy man. He was a you know, much traveled man. He had at least three missionary journeys that we know of. Uh, and they lasted for months and possibly years uh, that he was away from you know, uh, Jerusalem or his, or his home of Tarshish. So, um, there's something that Paul says here in this coming up verse, says, uh, in verse 14. I am, I am a debtor both to Greeks and barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Ron just, told, Ron just talked about it. He said that there was some, some, lack of a better word, there was some discrimination going on in the church where Hebrews and Gentiles didn't necessarily get along. You know, remember the, the book of Acts where uh, the apostles were, were brought uh, on, were brought to the floor about some things that the Greek, the Greek, the Gentile Christians, their, their, their women weren't being attended to. The widows weren't being attended to. So the early church fathers had to get together and devise how we're going to handle this. And so they elected seven men full of the Holy Spirit. And those men were called deacons at, uh, at that particular time. They, they were called deacons and they were to help assist the body of Christ in doing what the, the apostles could not do. And that that's historically where deacons come from. The whole foundation of deaconship comes from that uh, uh, scenario in Acts where they were were in conflict with the Gentiles and the Jewish uh, Hebrew, excuse me, Hebrew uh, Christians. So Paul says that he's a debtor to both the Greeks and the barbarians. Um, anybody that is not born Hebrew is considered a Gentile. So we all Gentiles on this call, regardless. You know, we, we saved now, but 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 back then. That you probably wouldn't be looked very highly upon from a, a person in the Hebrew uh, race. And so uh, Paul says that I, I don't make my gospel fit for one person. It fits for everybody. It's, it's, it's sufficient. It's, it's good enough. So I'm indebted to, to them as well. I, I have the burden to preach to both the Gentile and the, the barbarian, to the wise and the unwise. He's really using some elegant language, and he really is talking about to the rich, meaning the wise and the poor, 
via unwise. Uh, and then he makes this profound statement in verse 16 that we all should know. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is this, that Christ was born a virgin birth. He lived a perfect life. He died as a substitute for our sins. He was raised by the power of God through the Holy Spirit, and he intercedes for us now in heaven. That's, that's the gospel. That's everywhere Paul went. That's what he taught. He was consistent in it. He, he uh, could prove it through scripture. For the, when, he went, when he went to talk to people uh, in visiting cities, he first went to the synagogues and visited there and talked with them about Christ. And then he would go into the open market and preach this gospel to people. So it didn't matter where he was or, or who he confronted. He didn't. Um, make a, he didn't discriminate on who he gave the gospel to. And I think sometimes as Christians, we only see certain people that we want to deal with. And I'm, I'm going to be real with you. Um, some of us won't go talk to anybody outside of our race about Christ. And some of us won't uh, uh, open our mouths when we have the opportunity at church, I mean, not church, at work. Um, now I'm not saying that you use that opportunity uh, at work to uh, evangelize eight hours of the day, but you can talk to somebody in a conversation at your lunch, in your lunch period. You can talk to somebody about Christ during that time, but your main job is to, is to be there to work. But when you have opportunity, I usually let people lead me into that conversation. They may ask about, you know, something about, you know, hey, how's church? And then from there, I said, okay, you open the door opportunity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to walk through the door and we're going to talk about Christ. And so I just want to encourage you, don't be selective about who you present the gospel to because you never know who, who needs that gospel. You never know how the gospel may impact their lives. And, you know, and, and Paul also says that, that you're being built up as well when you witness to them. You're benefiting. It's a mutual, it's a, it's a trade-off that happens. You give some and you receive some. They give, they get some and you and they receive some as well. So this is the kind of attitude that we have to have as Christians. We can't be afraid. Um, First Timothy talks about, uh, tell, talks about uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. Anything that is not of faith is, is fear. Us being afraid to open our mouths, us being afraid to not want to offend people. And, I'm, and, and the whole job of the gospel is not to offend people, it's to present them an alternative for, to God's wrath. Because God, God is looking and he's not playing games and he wants everyone saved. And that's part of our... our uh, objective as, as, as ambassadors of Christ is to tell people about him, that they may know a better way to live, just like we have a better way to live now. So this power that, that Paul says, is, it can change lives, salvation. It can change lives. The word says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are passed away and the, behold, the, all things become new. When you accept Christ or when you have accepted Christ, a person has accepted Christ as their savior, they get a new name and a new identity with God. That's the whole purpose of salvation. It's to, 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 to free you from that bondage of having to be separated from God. So when we're talking about power, look at, I'm just gonna ask you to go, go back in your mind and, and go back to what Paul was before Christ. Go back in your mind and see what you were before you came to Christ. I, don't, don't confess it now, don't, don't do that. I just want you to think about it, okay? Now think about after Christ, after you have given your life to Christ, 
how much more beneficial has your life been? How much more uh, at peace has your life been? How much more have, have you been able to weather some storms that you didn't think you were gonna get through, but Christ held your hand through them and walked you through it? You know, you have one of the, you have the greatest resource. All you have to do is call on his name and that's the name of Jesus. No, and, and, and people that don't have Christ don't have that opportunity to call upon because you have to, first of all, have the relationship with them in order to call on. So take whatever opportunity God puts it in, in front of you to uh, be the witness because that same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that's living in you right now, the Holy Spirit. Um, start, uh, let's keep going. He says something about um, the Jews first and then the Greeks. The gospel comes to the Jews first because Christ, um, everybody in that community was, was Jewish. They were, they were Hebrew, Hebrews. Um, but then in that great commission, Christ says that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and then up to the utmost parts of the world. We'll start from the small and we'll expand out until whole, the whole world is evangelized and knows Christ as Savior. And this is part of the mission that, that, that Paul is on, is to get people to know who Christ is. It says, uh, verse 17 says, for it, is the, for it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. That's the purpose of the gospel, is to place your trust in God as the only alternative, as the only option for living. Okay, let me hear some comments. Uh, anybody have any comments, questions? I'm gonna keep asking you because I want you to, to really think about it. Okay, we'll keep going. Now here's the pearl portion where we're gonna probably have to figure out how we have to relate to people. Verse 18 starts out with a dissertation about the wrath of God. This, this is the punishment that we receive as a result of not having him savior, having him as savior. But I want to go somewhere first before we do that. Um, Psalms 19, one through six, you can turn there real quickly. Psalms 19, one through six. And my iPad's messing up here. Psalms 19, one through six, pretty familiar scripture. But this, this scripture talks about what Paul is getting ready to talk about. And Paul is gonna say, tell us that there is no excuse that anyone should have about not knowing who God is, but that God exists. In the, script, in the scripture, in the Psalms, it says, uh, verse one, the heavens show us how great God is. I'm reading it from the, another translation because it's just easier to understand. The heavens show us how great God is. The sky above shows his good work. Each day speaks about God until the next day continues the story. Every night tells us how, God, how great God is. They do not use words to speak with. Nobody hears their voice, but their messages, but their message around, goes around all the earth. Their words go all over the world. God has made a home in the, the sun in the sky. Each morning the sun comes out like a happy man who is just married. It comes out like a strong man who wants to run a race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens. It travels a big circle to the other end. Nothing can hide from his, his heat. That's, that's the uh, easy version. And uh, I'm using the um, new version Bible app. That's the easy, it's called the easy version. It puts it in plain English. But I wanted to show you just how descriptive it was. Um, 
It says that the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything that, that God made started with him, not with anybody else. Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. So Paul begins this dissertation about the wrath of God, saying that you don't even, you don't have an excuse because creation shows you that there was an intelligent designer behind it. Creation says that God exists because of what we can see. Um, about maybe six, seven years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Hawaii, and we saw uh, a lot of different waterfalls and rainforests and just beauty everywhere. And if you get a chance to go to Hawaii, you'll understand that there must be a God. Nobody can deny that there is a God because that, that place is beautiful. And so the heavens, the earth, the animals, um, the beauty, the creativity of God is all displayed where someone can't say God does not exist. You can't use that for an excuse because all uh, an artist creates a masterpiece, a work of art. No, it's not the work that's, that's the value. It's the, the artist, the person that made the work that, that is, is a value. It just testifies, the work testifies of the artist's creation. Activity. So when when uh, people say that they don't think that God exists, one of the things that we can use to witness to them is called general revelation. General revelation is all the creative things that have been made. The psalm that I just read about God's uh, creating the, the sun and the sky, and that He, he created it for His glory. That's called general revelation. Now, general revelation cannot save you, but it can give evidence that God exists. And sometimes that's where you have to start with people when you're presenting the gospel to them, is general revelation. It's like, um, if I take a watch, put it in a bag, use a hammer, beat it up, will it be a watch? It won't be a function, but it still has all the parts to be a watch, yes. So what general, general revelation says that all the parts are there that exist to show that God is alive and well. But there's another thing called special revelation. And special revelation is for a, a, a particular truth for a particular people at a particular time. Let me say that again. Special revelation is a particular truth that God reveals to a particular people at a particular time. That's called special revelation. He does it all throughout the Bible. You remember when God shows up with Abraham, he shows up with Moses, he, um, uh, Daniel in the lion's den and uh, the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Those are God's special revelation, but his ultimate special revelation is through Jesus Christ. When God stepped out of eternity and into time and showed us who he is, and we had, we had, um, we had a, a full focus of who uh, Christ was as a human and as a God, as God, excuse me, God and man together. That is God's ultimate uh, revelation is Jesus Christ's son. And the whole entire Bible there's a story about Jesus Christ from Genesis through Revelation. It all talks about Jesus, God revealing himself to us. So John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's special revelation, and you have to believe in Jesus Christ in order to get that special revelation. So I said a lot, but I, I want to get, I wanna, we probably won't get uh, all of this chapter done, but I want to um, look at verse 18 real quick. Uh, let me go back to where I was. Uh, verse 18 says this. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth for unrighteousness. God is revealing himself through general revelation. He's revealing himself through special revelation. And men are not believing it because they are suppressing the truth. That's what Paul says. It's our choice whether to believe God is who he is or to reject God who he is. And when we, when we reject him, we are saying, God, you don't know what you're talking about. I can live independent of you. And God's further on down in the scripture, God says, okay, go, go do it. Go, go live your life. Be happy. Don't worry, be happy. The ungodliness and the unrighteousness of man suppress the truth of God. And people don't really realize that that's what's going on when they reject God is they are rejecting an opportunity to live life, not to be um, restricted in their life. Jesus said that who, he who the son sets free is free indeed. You're not bound by the law anymore. It's the law that, that you'll have to live up to if uh, you don't accept Christ as your savior. Um, let's, let's go on to verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I just said that. That verse nine, uh, uh, Psalm, Psalms chapter 19, verse 1 through 6. The invisible characteristics of God are seen in his creation that you cannot deny that he is God or exists as God. Uh, verse 21, because they all, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of God, of the incorrupt, incorruptible God, into an image made like corruptible man and the birds and the four-footed animals and creeping things. They took the glory of God and of his creation and made that creation an idol in of itself and began to worship creation rather than worshiping God. And that's where the, the state of depravity of, of people are today. Not just creation, but they take they take um, they take um, material things, their houses, their jobs, make them out of gods because they rejected the the one and true living God. They use um, sex, money, and power to control people because they don't know any other way. They they we think that. They think that it's a wise way to live, but the Bible says that they've changed the, 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 the glory of God, an incorruptible God, into something else that, that had to be worshipped. And anything that you're trying to replace with God is idolatry. Anything it is. Um, your children, your husband, school, um, accolades, anything that, that God is not a priority in your life, is, is really an idol. And that's what Paul was trying to say, is that we think we're smart, but really God takes, the, the scripture says, God takes the foolish things and makes us look dumb when we think we're smart. He takes the low things, the lower things that we don't consider very significant and make them significant in the lives of, of, of our um, journey here on earth. So all the things that, that people are saying, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. The first thing as Christians, what we have to do is to say, what does the Bible say about this? What, how does this apply to scripture? And that's the only way, way that we're going to survive and still be uh, able to give this word out to people is to look and see what the scripture has to say about it. Um, he starts giving some specific examples about you know what people do 
He brings up um, homosexuality, he brings up lesbianism, he brings up maliciousness, he brings up malice, brings up um, discord, uh, disagreements. These are all, all sins. And I'm gonna be able to, I'm gonna give you time to ask your questions. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of rushing through this, this last part. Uh, and I want to say this before you became a Christ, became a Christian, you were also a sinner without hope. And so, as the church, we have to see people how God sees them. And I think sometimes, as the church, we have turned our noses up at people if that sin isn't the sin that we think is the most important sin. Um, what I'm saying is that we have to remember that the sinners do sin. And until they see what we are in Christ and, and can live that, live up to that, then we shouldn't reject anybody that's actually seeking Christ, regardless of what their sin is. Because we, we still have some things that we're dealing with as well. We have some things that, that we're walking in. We're not walking in the fullness of God all the time. And I dare say that most of the time, you know, we don't even have God on our mind. We just, we just know that we're covered. We have fire insurance. We know that we're going to heaven, but, we're, but the ideal is not to uh, just go to heaven, it's to, to live holy before God. And so when we turn our noses up at people that don't think like us, that don't look like us, then we're really rejecting them as a candidate for the kingdom. And so um, I don't I don't want to go any further than that. I'm going to stop right there. Pastor Sneed will probably pick up uh, probably around verse 26 next week. Um, but I want to give you an opportunity to, to ask questions, comments. Um, it's, uh, it's open mic time. So go ahead and ask your question. Minister Jones, this is Sister Pat Landry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just wanted to understand why did Paul go to prison? Okay. Well, Paul had a, had a knack for telling the truth. And people don't like to hear the truth. And there were probably a lot of reasons why he went to prison, but the most, probably the most, uh prolific reason he went because he was going against the Jewish establishment, the, the Jewish uh, leadership, um, where he was once a, a um, champion for them. Now he's a champion for the church that he persecuted. And so they were making his life hard. Got you. Thank, Thank you for that question. Sister Landry, thank you for your question. No problem. Thank you. Also, Reverend Jones, uh, Reverend Jones uh, this yes. is Sister Walker. Most of Paul's writing was done in prison, right? Not most of it, but some of it. Um, this heard? particular letter, this particular letter, he, he's he's pretty much in that quasi state where he's getting ready to go to prison, but he's he's writing them in advance. Yeah, yeah, some of his letters are definitely from, from prison cell. Go, um, Ron, you had a question? Uh, Thank you, Robin. Not a, not a question. It was more of a, a statement. And um, Paul, uh, it's, it's so interesting how uh, it shows how, how uh, God, through the sacrifice of Jesus, uh, allows for individuals who uh, weren't exactly, you know, had a lot of warts, but yet and still Jesus worked with them so that he, now, uh, who was once a, uh, a heavy prosecutor of the Christians, now became its greatest advocate. He was willing to kill individuals because of their beliefs. Now he is willing to sacrifice himself and die for those self-same beliefs. So now uh, his, his uh, uh, ministry now is, he's so grateful. Uh, there's, I, I just remember two people in the Bible that, that shows the power of Jesus' uh, restoration uh, properties, and that's Peter and, and Paul. Uh, both of them, once uh, uh, Peter gave up Jesus uh, by denying him three times, he was restored by 
about that stuff saved Jesus. And Paul, who was the greatest persecutor, was visited by Jesus, uh, uh, came around and uh, uh, turned, turned his whole life around. And uh, that's the reason why he was so passionate about giving this message out, because the Jews were uh, God's chosen people. That's the reason why uh, in, the, in the scripture that you read before, uh, the Jews were first. That was the God's chosen people. It shows that God has not given up on, on all of us, the Jews and right. also the Gentiles. He's not given up. So he still makes his word available to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, you remember in the 19th chapter of Exodus, uh, uh, the the people, the children of Israel, were getting ready to receive the, that covenant, but still they rejected it. Uh, whenever they Moses went up, uh, 19th chapter, 32nd chapter, he came back down and, and uh, destroyed the uh, the tablets because they had built up a golden calf. That's what you were talking about. They had started attaching in the, uh, uh, things to physical objects. And that's not the essence of what faith is. Faith is believing, uh, as Pastor Evans has said in the study Bible, faith is believing that God is telling the truth. That means that no matter what it is, it doesn't always have to be physical. Just believe in what he says and always maintain and, and retain that hope. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate that. Thank you for your comment. Amen. Yeah, Minister Sam. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I was going to say that I know we've all heard um, the statement that the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday is probably the most segregated hour of the day of the week. Uh, when you look at our churches, um, there's very few, well, more now are, are becoming more diverse, but the still, there's still a, a distinct separation. And Paul clearly shows us that God expects us to reach out and minister to everybody and not to have a division. I remember when we were at Cornerstone, there was a, a revival team that would come maybe every other year, and they were 99% white coming to a church that was 99% black. And that was some of the sweetest fellowship as we met with that other church and worshiped together. And we all had to be host host homes for them. And we one year we had two young girls who stayed with us. They were in their 20s. And their heart was just purely sold out to telling the gospel and reaching everybody. They didn't care if you were black, white, young, old. I mean, they just had that freedom and they had that sense of understanding that the gospel was for everybody. And so I think, you know, as a church, we would really grow in our Christian experience if we had a fellowship with a church that was totally unlike us, believe in church, not Christians, of a different race. And we sing with them, they sing with us, praise team join together, and you have a sense of love that you just don't feel um, in, um, in just regular separated congregations, because there's more to witness, there's more to ministry than what we just see inside our own areas of culture. True. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Reverend Jones? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that, that was great what Sister, uh, our first lady said. We, as Ben Washington, we used to, well, we used to do all that exactly what she said, um, you know, with the losing of our pastor and then uh, other things. But we fellowship a lot with uh, different denominations in Irving. Uh, we, you know, with different ethic and nationality. So, um, but that is true. We have to learn how to fellowship with it. the gospel is for everybody. No, there's no color on it. But I will say that Amen. we have fellowship with different denominations, just like what she was talking about at Cornerstone. We fellowship, we had people come in and everything. So it's been a blessing. And, you know, uh, we can, when all this stuff is over with, we can continue to do that. I feel Amen. like if Pastor let us do it, and I know that he will, we can continue to fellowship with all ethic because I've been trying to say for the longest, Look around our church mm -hmm. right now. What do we have around our church? It's Hispanic. Mm -hmm. It's Hispanic people. Is there mostly the live right across the street from Ben Washington? And I've been mm -hmm. over there talking to them. And you know, sometimes you never notice they're outside listening. Mm -hmm. and, but it's they when they listen, they can feel the spirit of God. So, but I would just like to say that we used to do that many, many, many times. Amen. I'm just Amen. saying used to, you know, I'm just saying, you know, we're going forward. <laughs> Amen. Thank, thank, thank you, we bring the good. 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Sister V. No, I was going to say, Rosalie, yeah, she even mentioned, you know, we are in a prime location for having a service, even if it's in Spanish, if that's what they need in order to have a better understanding. But if not, definitely having a more diverse uh, congregation, yeah. because we sit in a community that is truly diverse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's what I was going to add. You know, it's good to fellowship with other churches, but the whole Amen. point of the gospel is to get people the opportunity to accept Christ. Yes. And so those people that may not know Christ may not mm -hmm. look like us that are directly surrounding our our uh, worship center. Then you know we have the responsibility to, to show them and tell them who Christ is. Mm -hmm. I think you have to show them first before you can tell them. That's that's my personal philosophy. Yes. Yes. I can't I can't go talk about something that I that I'm not living up to. It's it's kind of hard to do that. Well, Reverend Joan, I have to say this, like when we had the food drive, that we, we had all kind of different ethic as showing the love of God. Um, they came through the food drive. So we just had to continue to show in all different kind of ways. If you don't mind me yeah. saying that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. And we and but we also have to follow up with with the with the message as well. Because right. they, they can come for the food, they'll come for the food all day. But you know, you're gonna give them, we gotta give them the bread of life too. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for uh, for your comments. Um, okay, it's 8.01. I don't want to belabor the time. Uh, I, I would like to have Pastor Sneed say something, but I don't want to uh, strain his voice or anything. So um, I'm just going to ask that uh, you continue to pray for uh, Pastor and, and Sister V, uh, Lady V, pray for her as well. Uh, the whole family um, and and just like Paul we mention our church family in our prayers uh, when we're praying we're praying for you whether you don't realize it or not uh, we're praying for you Pastor Lee, you got you got your voice uh, good job Sam we appreciate you man thank you so much man okay. amen 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 it's better right. it's better <laughs> keep your voice for Sunday Pastor <laughs> Reverend Jones Yes, ma'am. Your teaching was an easy teaching, if you know what oh, I mean. Thank you. Very okay. Amen. Amen. I have to Amen. for because for, you know I asked a lot of questions, but it was an easy teaching. Yeah. I thank God for you. Thank yeah. you. Amen. Well, you explained a lot. Purpose. You, you yeah. put it out there. Yes. The whole purpose is to educate people, educate us in our in our word and our walk, that our walk will be better. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. And if I if I came using big words and and all that kind of stuff to impress people, then I forfeited the opportunity to present the gospel. Oh, so amen. That, that's just my 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 personal um, mission. So yes. with that, let's uh, bow our heads. Like nobody has anything else. Going once, going twice. <laughs> Can I put plug money. in? <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> I just want to remind everybody of the breakfast, the Valentine's breakfast on Saturdays, nine o'clock yeah. at the Real Texas. Yeah. I mean, nine thirty. Sorry, mm -hmm. at the Real Texas Cafe in Newlands. Please join us for fellowship and good food. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. And the, and the address is on the website, so it's the flyer yeah, on I'm the sorry, website. Yes. So mm -hmm. you're there. Okay, mm -hmm. let's bow our head in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, it yeah. soothes our doubts and it calms our fears. It gives us confidence to know that we can walk upright and it gives us a, a guided path to who you are. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you will bless this word tonight that will penetrate our hearts and, Lord, that we will begin to uh, look at our mission and our goal a, a little bit differently than what we have in the past. And that is to uh, make sure that the gospel is preached and that the gospel is uh, given and distributed to people that need it. We bless you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a good night. Hope you Bye, feel everybody. better, Pastor. <laughs> thank you, Ross. <Roger. laughs> <laughs> Oh, he can talk. To, I, I can really talk now. <laughs> <laughs>